Okay, well, what about this uh, times of uh, COVID uh, at, 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 at Sweden? And it is, uh, it, it, let me see. I think the video has a problem, yeah? Yeah. It is much better now. Uh, yeah. only, uh, only a few patients uh, die every day uh, okay. and it's, go it's going down. So, so um, we, we hope for very good. But, we keep distance from each other. We wash the hands very much, and I don't. We don't go into the shops, and no theater, no concert. Yeah, but, I, I think here in Egypt uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, bitter. Some uh, some countries has opened the cinemas and also theaters, but some distancing with each other, and usually uh, all. Uh, is uh, intended to be to wear a mask. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, we, I think it will uh, it will be better. Uh, so uh, we hope uh, all uh, thing is better. Uh, hoping to uh, held a conference in Egypt to see you. Yeah, it should be fantastic. I never been to Egypt, so uh, uh, never. Uh, we, we... <laughs> uh, Professor Kimura visit uh, visit me in, in, in Egypt. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I know yeah. that, and uh, I think it, it that, that was uh, that was very good that you had him there. Okay, uh, you, you will start uh, some uh, PowerPoint or, or start the video uh, at first. We we I think we we wait to start until three o'clock. Is it or what do you want? Uh, you, you you will talk uh, at the first. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'll just uh, introduce you. Uh, again, uh, we, uh, we, we are with uh, dear Professor uh, Eric Stolberg, one of the most important one, uh, especially in single fiber EMG and electro neuromyography. So I uh, usually thank you for this amazing time and uh, your favorable time for uh, education, uh, all of uh, attendees, uh, especially in uh, Middle East uh, countries. So. Uh, now uh, we will speak about the neurography basics and advanced. This is the first uh, section. Then I think we will hold another one uh, presentation for speaking about the F wave. And uh, I think it's very important and a lot uh, in, in, in this topic, F wave and what about the repeaters? What about the uh, uh, variants of this uh, uh, interesting uh, topic? So uh, we will we, we can start now, dear professor. Stage with you. Yeah. Thank you very very much. For me, it's a great pleasure to talk to you again. It's uh, this this is the the way we have to do it in these days of Corona. I hope in future we will be able to meet each other in person. 
Yeah, uh, we uh, talk about neurography today, as you, you know, and uh, we have omitted, as you just heard, the F responses and A waves. There are many things to say about that. And I consider that as a natural part of neurography. But today we have not forgotten it, simply that there was no time for that. I think that in an EMG laboratory, we have the two main techniques, EMG and neurography. And if we had to have only one of the techniques, I think neurography is uh, the, the very important one. It is quantitative. We get numbers and we uh, get a lot of information from it now. And it has developed very much since it uh, started uh, long ago. So the quantitative information that we can get with neurography is very important, but we have to know the details of it. And uh, I will discuss in the video today a little about the different aspects on neurography. Many things you know, some things uh, I hope is new for you. So uh, good luck, lean back and uh, uh, see you in a few minutes with questions. Okay, I'll, I'll start now. Yeah. Okay. This webinar contains information, some of which you already know very well from daily routine, but some of which may be uh, a new information for you, I hope. We will talk about neurography, both motor and sensory. These are very useful techniques, uh, and they are mainly used to detect polyneuropathy and local neuropathies, focal disorders. And we try to uh, tell about the pathophysiology, severity, and distribution, including the localization. The methods that we use are standard motor neurography, and I consider F-wave studies being as uh, an integrated part of the motor neurography. It's not a separate study. Then standard uh, sensory neurography with uh, surface electrodes, and then very uncommonly near nerve electrodes, and then short segment studies, earlier called uh, inching technique that we particularly use for the study of uh, slowing of conduction in, in at the elbow and across the uh, fibula head. I have many pictures on uh, electrode placements that we use in our lab, uh, and that can be seen in a handout that I will uh, provide shortly. Just one picture showing that we use surface electrodes that can be a glue on electrodes like this. Uh, and we place one over the uh, belly of the muscle and the other is not over the tendon, which is here, but uh, further away. And we use uh, to place that uh, electrode at the most distal interdigital joint both in hands and in uh, feet in order to get that electrode as uh, silent as possible, not picking up activity from the muscle under study. And then we have surface electrodes for recording. And we have standard distances between the stimulator and the recording electrode. <clears throat> and what do we learn from uh, in neurography? Well, you all know this, but I just take a short look at it. Here is to the right the muscle, and we have a distal stimulation and obtain a signal, and we have a proximal stimulation uh, and obtain a signal. Uh, and in this way, by subtracting the two and measuring this distance, we can obtain conduction velocity. So what we record is amplitude, which is related to number of axons, the neuromuscular transmission, 
in myasthenia, we have lower amplitudes and the muscle volume. And the conduction velocity is related to the state of the myelin and also dependent on uh, axonal diameter. The measurements are usually including uh, parameters such as distal latency, which is indicated uh, at the first takeoff of the baseline or some other point that I will show. The amplitude is measured between baseline and negative peak. The duration is measured between onset of the signal and the uh, first zero crossing uh, line. And then the area is the segment under the negative part of the signal and the difference in conduction times are called conduction. And this is the conduction time. I will show a few examples of uh, things that we can obtain with uh, neurography. The first one is conduction block that happens in demyelinating disorders and also in focal lesions and they are important to recognize. Conduction block is that when we stimulate distally, we may get the completely normal signal, but when we stimulate proximal to the area of pathology, then not all signals are passing and therefore amplitude is lower. And the difference in these uh, signals is expressed in percentage and is called amplitude decay. Here's an example of Guillain-Barré, where we have the distal stimulation with a good amplitude of 3.7 and a proximal amplitude of 1.1, and it's a 70% difference. Somewhat slow uh, conduction velocity, and importantly, no F waves, or just one F wave. If we have uh, something we think is conduction block, then we cannot have normal number of F waves. So that is an important quality control. And the criteria for conduction block is studied in many publications, and there are a, a lot of suggestions and definitions. We have used a combination of the different com uh, definitions and say that if amplitude is decreasing by more than 25% at the same time as the signal is more or less unchanged in its duration. You know, if we have an increased duration, the amplitude also becomes smaller. So a dispersion change in duration should be less than 15%. And for the leg nerves, we have the fibular nerve. If we have an amplitude drop of more than 30%, and less than 30% dispersion. And the tibial nerve, we allow up to 55% amplitude drop, and the dispersion should be less than 45%. This high amplitude drop is due to special conduction conditions among the small foot muscles. So it is not really in excitability or any conduction block along the nerve. And in addition to this uh, drop in amplitude, we also have reduced number of F waves. We can say that conduction block really is associated with weakness. No impulses are passing. If we have just a temporal dispersion, that is not giving a weakness. We can easily wait for a few milliseconds uh, for an impulse to pass and the block is uh, important to detect and report that is all, often an autoimmune uh, neuropathy, may be treatable. Then we have demyelination situation. Uh, depending on where that happens, we may have a completely normal distal latency, but when we stimulate proximal to the problem, it, that can be either focal or more generalized, we have a longer 
conduction time there and therefore this comes later and often the signal is slightly more dispersed than at the distal stimulation. The amplitude is often just changed very little and here's a typical example from a patient with charcoal marie tooth type 1. We have uh, distal stimulation here with uh, a prolonged distal latency and here is the proximal and conduction velocity of 35 meters per second. Amplitude more or less normal for the uh, median nerve here, 5.2 millivolt and uh, no uh, amplitude drop. It's, it is uh, the amplitude dropped 16 percent and the duration increased only by six percent. There are different definitions of demyelination. It's difficult to say in absolute uh, uh, condition where, where we have or not have demyelination. But the rule of thumb is that conduction velocity is reduced to less than 60% of mean velocity. And that is, means, uh, for example, less than 38 meters in the median nerve in adult. And the prolonged distal latency more than seven milliseconds and normal or slightly reduced amplitude. That is the, the hallmark of demyelination. Now we go to the other type of uh, pathophysiology, axonal degeneration. Distal latency is completely normal, but the amplitude is low because we have fewer axons that are activated. And the proximal stimulation activates all these axons, but many of them have become degenerated here and we have a valerian degeneration so uh, they are not active here and therefore we stimulate only those that are surviving and uh, therefore recorded with an amplitude very similar to the one we get at distal stimulation. So low amplitude, more or less normal conduction velocity. The velocity in median motor nerve more than 40 meters is said in many publications. This the latency normal or slightly prolonged and no amplitude decay. Well, that seems to be easy that uh, differentiation between the demyelinating and axonal neuropathies. We have demyelination um, with slowing of conduction velocity and the amplitude on x-axis is within normal limits. Whereas if we have an axonal polyneuropathy, then we have low amplitude and we have low amplitude and um, more or less normal uh, velocity. And the problem we have in our daily work is in this area where we have a little of demyelination and little of axonal changes. And that is first of all true in biologically that axon uh, and uh, myelin are dependent on each other. So we have real combinations. And when we try to choose here, we had to go for the most dominating criterion. If we have very much of slowing or if we have very much of or reduction in amplitude. I should say that 85% of neuropathies are of axonal uh, type. Here is some examples of conduction velocity in the normal. Uh, we have a uh, distal stimulation, more proximal and even more uh, proximal uh, here in the uh, fibular nerve. And here we have a patient with CIDP where we stimulate distally and we have some late components. These are very low amplitude, difficult to see when we stimulate a little more proximally below the level of the fibula head. We see these late components giving a dispersed signal 
and that is even further if we go more proximal. Charcot Marie Tooth is a very homogeneous slowing in all the axons, and therefore the signal is not dispersed, but just all of the signals are, are delayed, slowing in conduction velocity. Here it was 27 meter per second. And here we have an ulnar entrapment where we have distal stimulation. We have a relatively good signal just below the uh, sulcus ulnaris, but above sulcus ulnaris, the signal is dispersed and it's more notchy than this one signal. So one can uh, judge a lot about the shape of the signal from different stimulating points about the pathophysiology. Now we shall discuss uh, the neurography and the difficulties and pitfalls and the influential parameters. We have many technical parts that can play a role electrode type, position of the electrode, reference electrode, muscle length, and so on, temperature. And we have the biological parameters that we are really interested in, namely the number of axons, size of motor unit, neuromuscular transmission, axonal di diameter, and myelination. So let's go over examples of that. The electrode type, they are not uh, uh, symmetric, all the electrodes. They can be elongated in different uh, ways. And larger electrodes give lower amplitudes than small electrodes. Here is one that you glue on, and uh, uh, th this happens to give an amplitude of, of about uh, 10 milliamp. Here's another electrode that is uh, elongated here, and that means that it makes a difference if we have the electrode along or across the muscle. If we have it across the muscle, we get shorter signals and we get higher amplitudes. Here it goes from 10 millivolt to 12.3. And here is a rounded electrode that is independent on the rotation and that gives in this case 10.4 uh, millivolt. Well, there is no truth. You can use any of these electrodes, but the reference values that you use must be obtained with exactly the same electrode. Otherwise you get the erroneous interpretation. Here's another thing that we may not think of so much. The position of the uh, so-called E1 electrode and the reference so-called E2 electrode. Long ago, it was recommended to have the belly tendon uh, position of the electrodes, but that is no good. We have the reference uh, further out to the distal joint. I'm interested to see what is the real contribution to the E1 and what is the real contribution to the E2. And therefore, we record from the muscle to a remote reference that is not stimulated at all. And here we record from the reference to a remote control point here. And let us see the signals. Here is the conventional subtraction signals that we obtain. And here is the pure muscle signal that is fine. And here is the reference uh, electrode signal that is very fine. It's not, not uh, much active at all. And this minus this one will give uh, this uh, response. If we do the proximal stimulation to the median nerve, then we obtain this signal that you recognize. But if we just record purely from the APB, then we get an early phase here on the signal, an identical phase for the E1 and E2. This is the action from forearm flexors uh, that we stimulate with proximal stimulation. And this signal, and this is identical, you see here, and they are subtracted and you don't see them at all as a, as a problem. The same thinking for the ulnar stimulation, 
ADM and little finger and we test that uh, in this way and here we see the typical two spike signal and we have the pure recording from the ADM here and we have a recording from the little finger an upside down uh, signal that is coming from the activated ulnar uh, innervated uh, interossi uh, muscles that will remotely give this volume conducted uh, signal. When we stimulate uh, proximally, then we will get uh, the uh, small extra signal from uh, flexor um, muscles, but not very much at all. And this remains because this is generated in the hand and not in, in the arm. Here is something rather fantastic in the tibial nerve where we record from, we say abductor hallucis. And here you see the, the conventional standard recording, abductor hallucis minus big toe. We have the, the E2 over big toe. If we just see the contribution to big toe versus a remote reference, you see a very large uh, signal that is recorded from the so-called reference. And this is obtained from the uh, many, many small muscles in the foot. This is the abductor hallucis response, a very small, uh, much smaller than uh, the one to the reference. And we, and we take this minus this, we obtain this uh, uh, signal. So the main part here is really coming from the reference and it really doesn't matter so much if we place this electrode exactly on the right um, spot. When we do the same thing with proximal stimulation, we usually obtain a smaller uh, signal that is normal. And when we stimulate uh, at the um, fossa popliteia and record from the big toe, you see that small response, but we also have an early response here. And this is coming from the tibial innervated uh, leg muscles. And exactly the same when we record from the abductor hallucis and when we subtract them, they disappear and we see this uh, response. So the abductor hallucis is a very small response here. That was the effect of reference electrode. Now we shall look at some other things. Effect of muscle length. If we passively move the thumb backwards and make the muscle shorter without uh, activity from the uh, subject, we see that with stretched muscle, we get this amplitude, 7.1. And then we make a passive flexion so that the muscle becomes shorter. The amplitude goes to 8.5, 9.5, 10.6, 12.2. Uh, you see a very large change in shape with shortening and also with higher amplitude. This has, for example, importance when we do a repetitive nerve stimulation and particularly when we do high frequency stimulation, the muscle is shortened and part of the so-called facilitation is pseudo facilitation because of muscle shortening. Another thing that is important is the effect of distance between stimulator and recording electrodes. Here is the motor side, eight centimeters was used uh, here and we get this signal. And when we uh, go to a proximal position, 22 centimeters, we get um, a somewhat lower amplitude, but not very much. And we go even uh, eight centimeters further proximal then the shape may change a little. In contrast, when we do the same thing with the sensory, the 14 centimeter distance, which is standard for us, we get high, good, nice signals. 
22 centimeters uh, di difference in stimulation recording position, you see a much lower amplitude with a reduction of 49%. And if we go a little more proximally, it is even a uh, lower amplitude. So these short uh, sensory axon signals, they will decay in amplitude much faster, much more dependent on distance than the motor. And therefore it's very important that our standard for sensory recordings is really uh, very strict on uh, distance. Well, the daily problem with stimulus artifact, we all know, the, um, depending on the conditions in the room and in the skin and uh, all these things, we can get this sometimes very large uh, influence from the stimulating uh, pulse, and that gives erroneous uh, recordings of amplitude and, and latency. So here we must try to get the, a flat baseline and one a way is to, to move the ground electrode between the stimulating and recording electrode. Another is to rotate the stimulator around the cathode so that the cathode is constant position and the anode is moving. And another thing that I don't show the signal is to use biphasic pulse stimulation, which is available in many EMG equipment. Now we shall look at another thing which is very good at uh, the ulnar uh, evaluation. That is to uh, stimulate with short distances. Earlier this was made with, with uh, one inch between the points. We have used uh, one centimeter and labs use different uh, techniques. So therefore we call it short segment study. We have three or four points below the sulcus ulnaris uh, and four points above the sulcus ulnaris, proximal to the sulcus ulnaris. And here you see the normal situation with a forearm uh, stimulation, good recording amplitude. And then with a longer and longer distances, we get uh, an, uh, a harmonic increase in latency a very small jump here just over the uh, uh, sulcus ulnaris is typical. If we now have a problem in the sulcus ulnaris, it may look like this. A good forearm uh, recording and here increasing latency and all of a sudden a jump. And then it goes on with the same latency increase as we have in the forearm uh, or in, in, at the distal parts of the study. And that means that this is a true uh, uh, jump here at one place and not an artifact. So here is a demyelination that gives us a local slowing. Good amplitudes and no amplitude change, no amplitude drop. Here is an, a recording from a patient with foot drop uh, and uh, we record around the fibula head. Here is a recording at the wrist, in, oh, sorry. Here's the recording at the ankle and here we uh, obtain the responses from below the fibula head and here is above the fibula head and you see that there is a, a sudden jump here which is demyelination but there is also loss in amplitude which is conduction block and then we look at the amplitude here if it was a general axonal degeneration also then this amplitude should be uh, reduced but it is uh, not. In this case, it is 6.1 and that is within normal limits. So this recording shows demyelination and conduction block and no axonal involvement. Here we have a similar situation, uh, extensor digitorum muscle here and recording from uh, stimulating at the ankle below knee, above knee, and you see the responses 
and the shapes of the responses. And here we get the abnormal response already at the stimulation below the knee. So the uh, pathology must occur uh, distal to the uh, stimulation below the fibula head. So it's not across the, uh, the fibula head. No extra changes occur when we uh, stimulate above the fibula head. Here's another situation where we have abductor hallucis recording and we stimulate at the ankle and at the knee, the tibial nerve. And you see at the distal stimulation, we have a very pronounced uh, dispersion of the signal and slowing of many, many components. And when we stimulate more proximally, we do not have more of that slowing. So all this slowing and all these changes occur very uh, distally in this ca case of CIDP. Then a few words about sensory recordings. <clears throat> We can do them orthodromically or antidromically. The antidromic are less painful. We get larger amplitudes, but there is always a risk that we also get a, a muscle artifact in the different situations. And the orthodromic, there is no muscle artifact and the lower amplitudes. We use the antidromic uh, in a one technique of carpal tunnel testing, the so-called 14-7 uh, technique. We use it in sural nerve uh, recordings and in radial nerve recordings. Orthodromic we use in some other um, situations, including some techniques for carpal tunnel. The conduction velocity is the same in both directions and they have uh, advantages and disadvantages for the different nerves. For the sensory recording, we can either use the fixed bar electrode or ring electrodes, or sometimes the uh, uh, sensory needle uh, recordings. The uh, start of the signal is either when it starts to, to leave the baseline, and that is very difficult to define often. So a better and more fixed uh, position is the positive peak or the place where the signal is turning upwards in negative direction. The negative peak and the positive peak. Uh, latency is often measured to the positive peak or negative peak. The duration is measured between the two peaks here. Amplitude is measured between baseline and negative peak, or in our case, with the computer will draw a line between the peaks like this and measure from that line just up to the negative peak. That takes care of problems if we don't have a good baseline. We can also measure the uh, area under the signal between this line and the signal itself. Here is one very important aspect, uh, and that has to do again with the uh, recording of, from two electrodes that we always do. Here is a fixed bar electrode and one uh, field pad is here and one field pad is here and the nerve is going under the electrode. The first field pad is recording this one and the second this one and there's a little delay between them which is the conduction time here and what we record in our instruments is the difference this minus this like this and you can imagine that if these electrodes and these signals are very close together then we get very low amplitude more or less zero uh, so the shape of the signal, amplitude, duration, and everything depends on the travel time between them. That means it depends on the distance between the electrodes and also conduction velocity. And this is very important, particularly when we do the recording with ring electrodes. We must measure so that we get identical distance each time we do the recording in a patient and also when we obtain reference values. 
Here we have a simulation where we have different distance between the ring electrodes. Here they are very close together and then we separate them more and more and we obtain a maximum amplitude at a certain distance. And then if we go at longer distances, then uh, we start to see the effect of the other electrode. So this is now the electrode of the first ring and here is an upside down of the second ring. So it is important to be aware of the sensory signals dependence on the distance between the recording uh, rings or field pads. Another well-known thing in uh, sensory neurography is the effect of temperature. With uh, this recording, this is an antidromic recording to digit three. Uh, this is 31 degrees. Uh, on the back of the hand. And here we have cooling uh, at 20 degrees. And that gives many effects. The amplitude is increased. The latency is also increased and the total duration is increased. So that can be a, a problem in, in the carpal tunnel study. We see uh, long latencies and Long latency can be either carpal tunnel or a cold hand. Cold hand has typical uh, high amplitude and uh, uh, carpal tunnel have normal or low uh, amplitude. So we uh, measure the uh, temperature on the back of the hand should be more than uh, 29 for the hand and 27 for the foot. If it is less than we heat with the uh, uh, heating pads or uh, the patient has the hands in in a water basin. And the electrode position uh, I will show in a handout that will be provided. <clears throat> it is not any principal difference in the thinking and interpretation uh, when it comes to sensory recording compared to the motor recording. Uh, there is a difference in the way that we per, uh, perform the study since we do not need to subtract any distal uh, problem as in motor, but the velocity is easier. It is simply to measure the time difference in responses between one stimulus position and the response. The differentiation between axonal and demyelination, it is the same principle, but some different uh, figures for that. But the, the principle is the same with amplitude and velocity combination. And in the same way, we define conduction block as the amplitude drop between two stimulation positions. So that is the end of this uh, lecture and I'm ready to take uh, questions. Okay, it's very great uh, uh, talk as usual, dear prof. Uh, uh, please, any, any, anyone uh, need to, uh, to, to put uh, questions in Q&A part? So uh, please, I want to ask, uh, I, I think a lot of, of questions uh, rather. So uh, in short segment stimulation, which preferable now, especially from Professor Kimura, he, he is the major element just, uh, just you, you, you can measure a focal defect on the nerve segment. So uh, in, in ulnar uh, across elbow, some there is anatomical variations to localize the site of excitation. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a, a challengeable a little bit. So uh, what's your suggestion? I, I think we, we have to be aware of the Martin Gruber anastomosis. So if we get funny relationship between the distal median and ulnar response, 
compared to the proximal, then we always have to think of uh, uh, anomaly, uh, particularly if the patient does not have any symptoms. So look at the textbooks. I did not have a picture of that. And, and uh, you just uh, have to think of it if, it, uh, if the finding does not make sense. It is important. Okay, uh, uh, but, but I'm, I'm also practicing uh, ultrasonography for the nerve. So there is what's called ulnar subluxation. Window flexion and extension, the ulnar nerve sometimes a little bit unstable. So uh, it's preferable to do electrodiagnosis uh, uh, for, for the ulnar nerve in quietly more than 70 degree flexion. It may be subluxated. It's me away from the anatomical position. So I cannot localize and, 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 and get a hit for the strike of the stimulations for the segment of the nerve due this to these variations. This is absolutely true. Different laboratories therefore use the, the full stretched arm. Oh. Other, other people have it very much flexed. Yeah. Some have 90 degrees and many laboratories have the patient lying down on the bed and have 45 degrees. But uh, there are little different uh, uh, normal values for this. And if, if fully stretched arm and a very strong con a bent arm is no good, somewhere in between, we use 45. Ah, great. Uh, in, in sensory conduction velocity, in sensory nerve stimulation, we can rely upon just one, one, one segment. Uh, we, we can stimulate the sensory fibers for the median nerve across the wrist, maybe at the ulnar. So what about the proximal stimulation? <clears throat> is, is, has any value or not? Uh, not. Ah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> no, I, I, I should say like this, because the amplitude goes down so very much with distance, we get very low amplitudes when we stimulate proximally and record from the hand, for example. But it is possible, but much lower signals. For the, for example, uh, over the ulnar, we usually do the motor testing, but you can also do the sensory testing and record from the little finger. But uh, you need averaging and uh, have to be very careful with artifacts. Okay, uh, I think uh, we're, 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 what, what you are talking about, uh, it, it is for adult uh, uh, parameters, but we have uh, some changes in children. They are more, more or less than three years due to some uh, problems for uh, complete demyelination uh, in shaving of the sensory and also in shaving of the motor. So how can we judge or accept it? Uh, it is uh, changing very much from the age of zero to age of five. After 15, they are adult values. But in the beginning, it is very dependent on the height of the, you know, on the age of the person. And after three, it is very much dependent on the length of the arm, the height of the baby. Mm -hmm. So, so we have to take care of the uh, both age and height, and the velocities are much lower in small uh, newborn babies. And you have to look at books to to look at each individual month, two months, four months, six months, and there are uh, published pictures and figures and tables on that. Yeah. Uh, in antidromic and orthodromic sensory stimulations, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I know that the antidromic is most uh, acceptable and most easier and most uh, uh, common use, but the orthodromic is a purely sensory stimulation. But the anti antidromic is both motor and sensory. So how, how we can solve this? Uh, well, I agree in some way. But if you <clears throat> take median nerve antidromic and you record from the finger with ring electrodes or bar electrodes, or, or if you record the finger, then it's a pure sensory recording. 
it's a mixed stimulation, but pure sensor recording. Mm. On the other hand, if you do the um, stimulation in the palm and record at the wrist, palm to wrist, here is a mixed nerve and the response is mixed nerve. So that is not so good. And the same thing with the medial tibial nerve. We think that is a, a sensory recording, but we have many motor nerves there. So that is also a mixed uh, study. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, in the carpal tunnel, if we have only a, an, uh, a sensory involvement and the motor are normal, then this stimulation and this recording can be normal because the motor fibers were normal, but, but the sensory we don't see. So yeah. that is a, a good thinking uh, that either the stimulator or the recording should be a uh, pure sensory. Yeah. So uh, what about the, the optimal timing for the study for motor and sensory nerves, the, the ideal after pathology? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean I, I, uh, some uh, professor uh, Omabathy said that the optimal studying time for motor is after four days of the insult, but after seven days of the uh, uh, pathology of the sensory fabs, you can study any abnormalities in the sensory and also after 10 for muscles. Uh, do you agree for this? I, I think it depends on which type of pathology. What were you thinking of? Uh, are you thinking about traumatic nerve lesion? Um, after, if you have cut the nerve with a knife, then uh, the distal, uh, distal amplitude may be preserved for uh, four or five days, and then it starts to decay very quickly. Uh, so um, if you want to see if the nerve is intact, you cannot re rely the first few days only on distal amplitude. You must stimulate below and above the place of uh, problem. But the distal um, is more than five days. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, uh, dear Professor uh, Stroudberg, uh, this in era of COVID-19, uh, we have a lot of, uh, of cases of Guillain-Barré. So especially in, in, in pediatric. So uh, we can uh, do uh, motor and, uh, and sensor and also F waves and all this in, uh, in, 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 in normative values. So how we can uh, predict the uh, very earliest changes in the embryo in, in such cases? First of all, if we talk about Guillain-Barré, real autoimmune Guillain-Barré, not COVID, but real, then I think the changes can be seen on day one or day two. Uh, the first thing is that we see uh, A waves and after a few days, we also start to see uh, low amplitude and conduction block and they can be proximal. So therefore we have to, to look at the F waves, the fewer F waves very early. If the patient has weakness, it must be reduction in motor amplitude or conduction block, like loss of F waves. So, um, uh, Guillain Barre, in earlier days, we said you don't see much of, until after two weeks. And that is true for conduction velocity, but all the other parameters come much earlier, day two. You start to see A waves, a conduction block, few F waves, and reduce the EMG pattern. Yeah. When it comes to COVID, I'm not sure that this is uh, uh, Guillain Barre. Mm. I, I think it is a critical illness neuropathy or critical illness myopathy, like we see in many other diseases that have patients in the respirator. So we should not call them guillain -Barre. We should call them uh, 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 COVID, uh, COVID neuropathy or myopathy. Um, and, and the first sign very early 
we see denervation. And we see denervation both in myopathy and neuropathy. And you know that most patients with general uh, critical illness, they have myopathy. It's much more common than neuropathy. And I think neurophysiologists all over the world have delayed the development for 20 years by saying guillain -Barré. And it has been completely different things. It has been a, a myopathy. Yeah. Uh, you can see the question uh, bar uh, there, Professor? Or, or can I read? No, you, you, you must read. OK. I think it's, uh, it's very long, a uh, little bit. Uh, there is a question regarding the pediatric age group. Uh, can we rely on the lab normative data regarding the amplitude to judge the result? So uh, he, he, he completes uh, the question. I mean, children below six months, difficult to get supramaximal stimulation. So how we can have uh, reach it to the normative uh, amplitude level? Um, are you talking, I didn't hear, was it the, 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 um, the children? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I agree completely that it is um, difficult to get supraliminal stimulation, but often you do not need to stimulate so much. They have thin skin and superficial nerves, and we do not really stimulate too much. And uh, one shock is uh, enough to give a good amplitude. So uh, I agree with the problem and I have no uh, special uh, solution. Okay. Uh, another uh, question, in case of severe and long-standing CIDB, uh, uh, there, uh, there is uh, always no response from the motor and sensory nerves. Do you think facial nerve can be helpful in such case? Even the patient has no uh, any abnormalities in the facial nerve? I think uh, it is true. Th this is a problem in the late C CIDP that we lose responses. And uh, uh, the facial nerve is, uh, is uh, preserved for a longer time. It's, it's very good to make the blink reflex. Yeah, blink reflex. Uh, another question, the role of nerve conduction study in predicting the prognostic value and recovery in facial palsy? Uh, it, uh, I have used that very much together with ENT people. If the patient has a complete palsy on one side, we, uh, after day five, we compare the amplitude stimulating nasal is left and stimulating on the other side. And if we have a nearly normal response on the paretic side, then it must be a conduction block. And that is very good prognosis. Mm -hmm. If you have very low amplitude or no response at all on the bad side, that is an axonal degeneration and that takes months to recover and then you have everything in between. So we, we like very much to look particularly at the M response with the facial nerve stimulation and recording, for example, nasalis muscle. Yeah, uh, and, and can we uh, getting uh, sometimes uh, for uh, therapy, physical therapy, uh, and regain, repeat uh, again the uh, uh, neurography, to, to see if there is gaining a much uh, better amplitude, uh, no, no, no conduction block. Uh, in, 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 in any prognostic values we can see? Yes, we, we think so. We, Two months later. We, we, have, we have seen that we can differentiate a conduction block and axonal degeneration already from day five and definitely from day 10. And uh, then we have followed patients over time. Uh, so if you do it after three uh, weeks, you can say for sure that this is a severe axonal degeneration and it will take up to one year to recover. Yeah, uh, sorry uh, for, 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 uh, for, uh, for your time. Uh, there is a question, a role of area in conduction block. Uh, conduction block mainly occurs 
either if you have an entrapment like in ulnar, but in general, if you have conduction block in other nerves, then it's often a sign of autoimmune disease, for example, Guillain-Barré or something like that. And for neurophysiologists, it's very important to try to find a conduction block because that cannot be an axonal uh, neuropathy. It is and um, demyelinating autoimmune disease that maybe can be treated. So it's important for us to hunt for that. Yeah, great. Uh, I think uh, the last one. Uh, uh, I have a case uh, from Dr. Sausan. Uh, I have a case with uh, uh, the right, uh, uh, right-sided facial palsy. There uh, was myopemia in, in EMG with normal CMAB and latencies. Uh, while in blink reflex, the only contralateral R2 was absent. Can we localize the lesion in uh, Primstem? Well, uh, if R2 is abnormal and uh, the others were normal, then we place the uh, abnormality somewhere in the brainstem. I suppose. So it is not in the peripheral part of the, of the uh, facial or tradiaminal nerve. That's great. No. Yeah, okay. Uh, any question again? No. Okay. I have, I have one comment that uh, I sent to you some I pictures know. and handouts. So can you tell the people that, that um, you are going to send it to them? We have some uh, all these pictures plus uh, the electrode positions that I provide. Okay, uh, uh, Professor uh, Stahlberg, get me a handout, very exciting one. I will share it on the, uh, the group. Uh, you, you can get it. Uh, any question again? Okay. Uh, so, uh, in, in lower trunk uh, plexopathy, such as uh, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, we can relay it in, in early stage uh, abnormality of the medial antibrachial cutaneous. But a little bit, the techniques has some uh, challenges and also we can get some motor artifacts. So uh, what's uh, your suggestions? Well, it, uh, this is a very good example where motor and sensory together can uh, localize the problem. For example, if we think of radiculopathy or plexopathy, radiculopathy often have normal sensory responses, but, but uh, as you know, the, the uh, uh, plex plexopathies have, have disturbed sensory uh, involvement as, as, as well. So, so I think uh, EMG plus sensory neurography is very good to follow a plexopathy and diagnose it. Yeah, uh, I think the, the, the last one uh, from Dr. Sausan, is there uh, a normal percent uh, for a block in the surface uh, single fiber EMG? I think um, it comes out. But, in, uh, a normal percent for blocking? Yeah. Yeah, uh, zero, zero. Uh, it should be no, uh, I that is simple answer. It should be no blocking and not increased jitter uh, in normal. But all of us have some, some trauma to the nerves with life and kicking football and, and so on. So we allow one, ab two abnormalities out of 20 in single fiber EMG. And that can be both increased jitter, but it can also be blocking, but not more than in two recordings out of 20. Yeah, great. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, please, uh, we, I, we want again uh, another talk about F-Wave and A-Wave, which is, will be as usual, very interesting. So I can, uh, again, thank you very much, very, very much, dear Professor Starberg, for your ed educational uh, cane, for, uh, for uh, junior and uh, and, and, and us uh, as a doctors, yeah. So uh, I think, uh, I think Dr. Azmi, sorry. 
what is about last question, but there is a question from Iraq. Uh, Dr. Azmi said, uh, is there any uh, rule uh, for musculocutaneous nerve in the diagnosis of herpes palsy and cervical radiculopathy? Uh, uh, well, the... the, the uh, motor, yeah. The, the, you're talking about the motor, motor response. Yeah. For musculocutaneous, be careful to place the recording electrode over biceps, but the reference should be up here on the shoulder, not down at the uh, elbow, because you get a lot of artifacts. So look at my pictures where, where the reference is. That is an important thing. Thanks, uh, dear prof. Uh, uh, good luck uh, and see you uh, soon, very soon with the, the other talk. And uh, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all and have a good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Bye bye. Uh, so, uh, the attendees, I will uh, share uh, the uh, handout from Dr. Stelberg at the my uh, uh, page in uh, uh, Facebook, uh, the Egyptian Neuro Rehabilitation and Electroneuromyography. I will type it, uh, then join the group and will find the uh, handout, Egyptian. Neuro rehabilitation and electro neuro myograph. Okay, uh, please uh, all join this page and I will uh, put the hands out uh, from uh, Dr. Eric uh, and thank you for joining us for uh, this uh, very amazing. Uh, uh, talk with uh, an eminent one, Professor Eric. Uh, me, if anyone interest, uh, tomorrow we have uh, another talk with uh, uh, Professor Tolga from Turkey about the hip ultrasonography and its pathology. I think it's very better nowadays to, to be uh, combined with the electrodiagnosis and also the ultrasonography. It will uh, get uh, a lot of information on, I think this is the future uh, scope uh, later on. So uh, goodbye, and uh, I will vote the hands out. Uh, see you tomorrow and after tomorrow. Bye. Assalamu alaikum.